di delivering digital differently. Um, I don't know if it's that different, but um, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, this is what I think is important for local government, active digital leadership. And these are the five areas that I think we should look at. And I think there should be stronger political leadership from peers, my peers and cabinets and leaders of councils, and I don't see that yet. Um, and uh, I think it goes like this. Uh, I work in the video games industry, and the video games industry uh, has been supercharged by um, mobile phones over the past five years. Mobile gaming has basically uh, made the industry stronger. It's created new business models. Um, it's enabled us to reach across to European customers and create global platforms. And that involves a discussion about data. And we have the technology now to use our data and create new business models and do things that we didn't think we could do before. And I don't think that the lessons from uh, from, 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 from uh, mobile games and other parts of technology can't be applied in local government. In fact, I think they can. Um, one of the ways in which data is used and the freemium, free-to-play business model uh, for video games is uh, that es essentially it's used to enhance the customer experience. We only monetize 4 to 5 percent of customers on a free video game where they get in-app purchases. Um, but if you make the game better and you collect the data and you know how people are playing um, and you make it uh, more worthwhile for the customer, you're going to, in, in the end, get more loyal customers, more people will want to buy the game, and you can make better games, and you can know what people want. Now, I'm not saying local public services are exactly the same as that, but you can begin to see if we, if we have a greater insight into what people want, uh, perhaps we can do far more than we're doing uh, at the moment. Um, Customers also, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure many of you have seen this, especially if you've seen my presentation before. Uh, but this is kind of like what we're about. And, you know, Eddie will say there's another one which says battery below this as well. Um, but there's a greater public expectation of 24-7 digital, which we need to respond to. Obviously, we need to respond to people who can't use the internet. Um, but I've got a problem with those people who want, won't. Um, Peter Mandelson used to call them Radio 4 listeners. Um, um, you could also say that they were elected members as well. But, the, but there is a, there's a challenge there. But I think, you know, we've all been through the debates around channel shift. Uh, but, and I think fundamentally we'll be in a different place in five years' time. And we need to create the platforms and systems for all of that to happen. Why? Because all of local government is changing in public services away from traditional budgeting, uh, the incremental budget setting which created strong departments over the years, consistent delivery uh, you know, in the, in the 90s and the last decade, more towards uh, focusing on outcomes, not just for councils but for public services, and really looking into how uh, our systems work in councils. Everybody's, you know, Camden's gone through uh, you know, over 140 reviews, housing repairs and things like that, and just stripping away some of those layers of culture that grew up over the years and looking at how services can be developed cleaner. And for that, we need uh, to have technology. Our digital economy is powering this very much. This is a, a loft above Gilgamesh Restaurant in Camden, which used to be a... Uh, uh, a storage room. Now it's a place where KPMG advise new tech entrepreneurs. We need to look at connectivity and talent in the area, and we also need to look at the new elements of digital services. And this is what I would suggest are the elements currently of digital services um, that, we, uh, that we are looking at, um, and looking at how we use open da data and analytics more uh, and to create more transparent and effective services how uh, we integrate with local public services, and we focus on citizen needs, not just their wants, which is a big challenge for a politician, especially when they come towards election time, and support the growth and investment in the digital economy. These are the elements that I think everybody should be incorporating, every political leader should be incorporating in their digital strategy. Sadly, when you look at the city deals that are out there, that are you know, constructing the devolution debate, there's very little to be had. A little bit in Manchester, a little bit in Birmingham, I think a little bit more in Birmingham, actually, um, but very little. In London, it, it, almost completely absent from the London proposition, discussion about data um, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, devolution and common standards. Um, in the f working towards the future, I think... Um, we will have to move towards 
uh, common standards between public authorities that will require leadership from politicians and senior officers, a new public service culture of sharing, looking at shared services, uh, Camden's embarking on a big shared service programme uh, with, uh, with Islington uh, and Haringey. I think you'll see more of that in the future. The nature of that shared service, you know, will it be run by the public sector? Will it be a standalone company? What's the uh, scope to expand beyond that will be a big source of debate and creating problem-solving platforms, which I think is really, really fundamental. Challenging authorities to say, well, what are the top 10 problems that we're facing? And is there a role for the voluntary sector, private sector, social enterprise to come in uh, and help us solve them? And for that, we need to be clear and have to have strong leadership. Fundamentally, I think with active uh, digital leadership at a local government uh, uh, level, a local public service level, we can get to a point where, without being too wordy, we can have digitally enabled subsidiarity. Subsidiarity, which is the concept of, uh, of what's the right level of go government that, uh, that, a, that a function should be exercised at. Uh, imagine if we had a, uh, an approach which said, what's, our pro what's the problem we need to solve and what is the right level of government down through to the community, the family and the individual in which that person could be empowered or that community could be empowered to solve that problem. And I think that poses not just a question about technology, but actually the nature of the state, the nature of local government and governance, and ultimately political leadership. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Paul Matheson. I work at Southend Council. I'm actually Group Manager for Transport Planning, Coastal Defences and Flooding. So I was asked to come here today by our Director of, Play Director of People, um, Sally Holland. She couldn't make it. Our Head of IT couldn't make it, so I'm afraid you've got me. Um, but I'm actually a practical user of IT. I'm not an IT specialist, but I've been working very closely with IT colleagues over the last 18 months or so on the transformation of services in South End. So I thought I'd bring you a slightly different perspective to perhaps from people you've been hearing today, which are the IT professionals, about how we are using um, in, in our department and how we're addressing some of the issues around smart cities. So I'm, I'm very um, fortunate, I think, to be working at South End with a number of quite enlightened colleagues who want to spread across and break down the silos. And that's part of the message I'm going to sort of give you, give you, the, give you today. But then I decided I don't need to do any of this because I attended the Build an App in 20 Minutes session so I can actually go away and do it all myself. So I think that's kind of an interesting aspect of here, of taking some of that back. Um, these are the questions I think that are posed in this particular session. Public services, business models, public-private funding. So I'm going to give you some examples and some ideas around those sort of uh, questions from a user's perspective. Um, when I was talking to my IT colleague about the presentation, we were discussing how things have changed. And, you know, do we judge the future on what's happened in the past? And he gave me some statistics around sort of 10 years ago around dial-up internet access and the first mass release of the iPod. And I think we're all, you know, we all remember that, don't we, of carrying the brick round in our pockets. And now we've got the smartphone. And interesting, the previous presentation talking about the gaming. And then I dug up something from 1939, which was a prediction of the cities of tomorrow. And that envisaged everybody, uh, you know, using helicopters, living in high rise and all those things. So, you know, is the past really a predictor of, of the future? So what is the future looking like? Um, we all use, and we use in a business sense now, um, broadband, Facebook to connect people together, iTunes and Uber. I was in New York recently and we moved around, the family moved around using Uber all the time. So it's impacting on our daily citizen type needs. Um, and I think an interesting slide again there, talking about global, regional and local trends. The suppliers and markets were influenced and adapted to global cross-market trends. So what does that matter to me when I'm dealing with daily issues of traffic signal control and street lighting and citizens reporting a pothole? What, what's the interface there? Um, this comes out of uh, PAS 181, which is the uh, advisory standard for smart cities. And I think it sums up very well the challenges that we face, um, socioeconomic, 
political, environmental. And it all comes down to, I think, quality of life for the citizen, putting the citizen at the centre of this. And that's where we've made a shift, I think, over the eight, last 18 months from technology to citizens. And that's an interesting piece of work carried out for uh, future cities demonstrator projects. Um, not an easy document to pick up and read, but really worthwhile, I think, if you have the time. Um, and I've, I've used this slide before because we are producing and developing our own smart city strategy, early days yet. But when I looked at everything that's going on above the level of the building line, somewhere in there the council has an involvement, whether it's energy, whether it's society, whether it's big data, whether it's care, whether it's the internet of things. We're interfacing with all those all the time. And perhaps it's led by the IT department, but it's actually an in interface between the providers of those services and, and the citizen. A um, little bit of context that we're working in at the moment. Uh, we belong to uh, the European Innovation Partnership. Southend is one of the founding members of what we call the Small Giants, which is a network of smaller sized cities collaborating together. Um, Future Cities Catapult, and the emergence of a number of smart city demonstrators. So you've got to be aware of what is going on around you. Um, and a couple of statements there around the future of technology solutions. This is, I put this together with my IT colleague and he, he likes to use the word it's a bit bitsy and it was. Um, we had a number of IT contracts coming up for renewal. We, we started thinking about sweating our assets. How can we use our underground ducting? How can we use our lampposts? How can that plug into the corporate priorities? And we decided, you know, IT is a fundamental building block to create all these new opportunities and new services. And what sort of leverage income can we develop from our assets? Simultaneous events. Um, new data centre work awarded to Logicalis, um, City Fibre, WAN across the borough, wireless concession. We've got new waste contracts with Veolia, who are using a lot of new technology, uh, particularly apps. New parking enforcement contract, which is going to be using a lot of technology in it to reduce the amount of on-street work, particularly in the issue of penalty charge notices. We've just launched a central management system for our new street lighting contract, um, replacing all the borough LED lights with LEDs. That's worth 13.5 million. A whole raft of work around asset management and fixing potholes and street furniture. Interesting, the, the 20 minute app example was actually about reporting defects in the street, and that's something we're working on. And the other aspect of that is what brings it together is the citizen account. We did some early work um, developing our smart city strategy in looking at what we're doing at the moment, and that was a real um, I think light bulb moment. We spoke, or we, uh, uh, our consultants spoke, to um, 30 or 40 people in different departments. We found great work being done at individual and team levels, but missed opportunities. Um, duplications in work, in people, in processes, in systems, under utilization of assets. And we had, I think, a lot of highly skilled staff performing clerical tasks, which may resonate uh, uh, with you today. Um, Breaking down the silos is really, really important. One example of this, and you may already be aware of this, is, is the development of the citizen account. Um, and it's about a one-stop shop for the citizen to engage. And what we've really got to do now is draw those internal services through that one portal, um, which will manage the back office systems and bring a lot of our current systems in, into line. This is something that I've been working on um, with colleagues, it was around um, street lighting. And if you're not talking to your street lighting colleagues, I think you're missing an opportunity, and I'll explain a little bit more in a minute. We were successfully leveraging a green investment bank based on energy savings. The energy savings pay for the green investment bank loan, and we achieve a 25 million pound saving over 25 years. And a lot of that is predicated on energy savings and how you can introduce incremental energy savings, and that fundamentally uses IT systems. When we procured it, we were really careful that we wanted to seek a supplier that was innovative and would take a broader approach than just street lighting. There's a project in Europe called the Humble Lamp Post, and that's about adding technology to street lighting columns. The central management system, 
tender said, you know, we really want the equipment to bring a significant level of added value. And that little diagram, if you can see it, has sensors fitted that measure air quality, monitor waste bins, look at traffic systems, movement, and security. And, and we're working very closely with our colleagues in CCTV to see if we can monitor security alongside street lighting levels. And the opportunity now to dim and raise uh, uh, street lighting is there. If I just, sorry, if I could just move sure. around the back here. This, this, I borrowed this off my colleague's desk yesterday. This, this is not, you know, it's not a cost of coffee cup. It's actually the bit of kit that goes on top of the street lights. And this is called an LCU NEMA. NEMA refers to the number of sockets, light control unit. This has five normally. Um, some local authorities use three. Three control the street light. Nine Two control the dimming, and the remaining two can control other applications. So this might control how, how full is your waste bin, and it operates across a radio mesh frequency system. This is the dashboard that we currently use. Um, you can monitor the outages, you can monitor energy, um, but you can add a lot of other features to it as well, such as movement and uh, air quality. Um, Quick words here around, it's a bit of a plug actually for the Small Giants Initiative, the European Innovation Partnership on Smart Cities holding an event in Eindhoven in May, and we're encouraging other cities of less than 150,000 population to join this exciting networking initiative. Finally, some applications we've been developing. Um, Trace is an application for walking and cycling tracking. Um, which gathers data for us. Couldn't have done this two years ago. Big development uh, in the area of gathering data and people's expectations. This is a an app that we're using in South End to exploit digital connectivity in a local park. Um, and this is a simple map showing coverage of our uh, free Wi-Fi in the town centre. The trick for us is how do we actually join all of this up? Um, how do we take all of those services with all the new technology and actually make it happen? So I hope I've given you a kind of flavour of, of what, um, what's coming along. Key areas here, information, procurement and business need. The one I think is really important to us, and I, my procurement colleague will thank me for saying this, is procurement. Get it right and procure the right systems. Uh, and understand how you can work with colleagues in other departments. Um, that's it. Thank you Thank very you. much. With a couple of questions for each of our, our panellists and then really keen to hear what, what the audience thinks. And, to start with you, Theo, you, you mentioned an issue dear to my heart that is actually looking at the business model of public services. And uh, I think there's been a narrative for the last five years where by um, potentially in some parts of the public sector, we've been digitising what we already do rather than going, actually, how do we rip this apart and take inspiration potentially from the private sector, the gaming industry, to do it differently? The question is always, though, give me some specific examples. What does a new business model look like? Um, do you have anything that comes to mind, or where would we start? Well, I don't think we're, we're there. That we're, we're really there yet. I think we need to first take steps into things like shared services. I think we, uh, we're also, local government is on a journey, as I uh, described, essentially changing the way uh, that we budget uh, in many cases. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the opportunity for innovation is not quite on us yet, but I can see a future in three, four, five years' time um, as we get more comfortable with the, the new ways that we budget, um, where external partners in the private sector will become more comfortable partners uh, with us. Um, and I don't mean to be vague, but there was a, there, there is something quite um, fundamental on the journey from how local government used to budget um, uh, and having those strong departments to um, moving in the direction of, of an outcomes-based framework. And that's moving from the idea of spending 
on departments to investment in achieving an outcome. And I think that's quite uh, a big step. Uh, it's a big psychological step for, for public service. Um, and I think that that's, that's not quite yet. If I look at the process that we've done in Camden, the first round that we did, we didn't get it quite right, but we made steps toward it. We're now going to do another one four years later, and we're on that journey. Thank you. And to Paul, I guess the, the, the key thing or the key question that arises for me from your presentation is it sounds like the role of the council is changing quite fundamentally, and particularly in the whole smart city context when uh, you mentioned past views of helicopters and high rises. The council is having to cast its mind forward it, you know, to try and future gaze. It's trying to create new uh, partnerships with industry. How do you see the role changing? And are councils ready to change in the ways that would be required? Yeah, I think so. I think the important thing is when we started to look at this, it was the technology that was driving it. I think we've taken the view that we need to put the citizen at the centre of this. How does the citizen want to access our services? How does the citizen need to interact with us? Um, the citizen account, I think, departs from the normal way of just report and wait mm. to that interaction. I've reported it, but I need to know when it's going to be fixed. I need to know somebody's sorting it out, or I want to have a conversation with the council. Mm. We've got several apps that try and attempt to do that, but they're very, very early stages. I will, you know, I will report it and I will wait. What we also find is the citizen is interacting with us on a whole host of things. It may be a conversation about social care, might be a conversation about um, concessionary fares, it might be something to do with housing, and it all focuses through our um, contact centre at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the contact centre just fires that out to individual departments. And we don't know who's talking to who. What we're attempting to do is bring that into uh, the citizen at the centre. So if Mr Smith wants to make a view about something, we can, we can join that up in the back office too. Mm -hmm. So if a pothole is reported three times, we know it's been reported three times. And that's really important to us in respect of councillors as well, because the escalation route we all follow is, if that citizen doesn't get a reply within 24 hours, the councillor is complaining. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you've worked in local government, as we all have, you know how difficult that can be. So, so <laughs> the driver here is we cannot continue to resource that level of interaction yes. with the current way we're doing things. It's got to change because it will just exhaust our resources. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a great opportunity um, of pulling this out of a crisis to say mm -hmm. this, is, this is how we can do it. So because councillors because are the problem, Theo. Well, yeah, yeah, well, we're coming up to our AGM, so I, I probably agree with you. But um, the... the uh, I think actually there are a number of opportunities where we can really uh, advance things that are coming up for most councils. Um, one is the interaction with the uh, with the NHS, uh, really sharing data. We share the NHS number um, with with the local NHS, and that's we've we've seen um, I think uh, much better working with them. There's some councils that communication still by fax because it's it's really secure. You know, um, so and that's to deal with bed blocking. You know, and that's people's lives, and we're, we're communicating like that and not joining things up. Um, we need to move on from that. And the second thing, I think, apart, you know, apart from like our links with the NHS, is the renewal uh, or the retendering of waste contracts. Yeah. And you, you mentioned it, and that's a really good example. Um, they're very large sums of money, very large sums of money being spent. Mm -hmm. We need to educate citizens to do more recycling. There is a relationship that you need to build <coughs> with someone in that household through uh, an account that they'll have at the council. It's a much more dynamic relationship that we can do, um, and it's a challenge to the private sector mm -hmm. um, to develop their model from essentially one that mimics the public sector model of, of you know, sort of report and wait to something that's much more dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, uh, there's a tremendous potential for innovation there. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Questions, comments? Yes, gentlemen at the front, and again, just uh, name, organisation, and brief question. Uh, Callum Knowles uh, from RNS. I've had the pleasure of working for both councils here, and especially with uh, Paul and Southend. Uh, Southend, when we first met them several years ago, uh, they were trying to, they were looking at doing several things separately. 
and it was just very lucky that uh, Nick, being the one director, being above several of them, actually saw several different projects that interlinked into each other, the Wi-Fi concession, the data center, et cetera, et cetera. And he stopped several different things happening separately, took a step back and saw that the projects could interlink and there would be savings and a better experience for the citizen. Uh, it needs to happen more. I'm sort of duly challenged because I'm a portfolio holder for my council and I hold <laughs> IT as well. And I now am challenged with implementing that within my own council. So it's, uh, you know, I need to, you know, take some of the, the lessons and implement them. But again, I think where I'm getting to is uh, councils need to take a holistic approach mm -hmm. rather than be siloed on this because South End has proved the savings and the better delivery of service uh, to its citizens. So let's put that space. to our two panellists. You both mentioned sort of need for integration, need for to break down silos. We've probably been having conferences like this one from five years ago talking yeah. about the problem of yeah. silos. Yeah. What do we do about it? Well, I think speaking from my own example you know there are networks within networks if you believe a council just runs on the committee meetings and uh, senior uh, managerial board meetings we've found that by finding the right interested people in those departments and having a common language you can achieve an awful lot so our smart city work is, is a small group of uh, sort of senior managers who are preparing and, and developing some ideas and thoughts for the management team to consider. Um, it's a little bit under the radar, it's a little bit sort of informal, but I think that's the way some of these structures work better. So um, my view really around this is, is fight, you know, you've got to have the right colleague in procurement, you've got to have the right guy in IT who can see beyond the day-to-day -day operational activities, and you've got to have some fairly innovative people delivering those services who are prepared to get down that table and think about some of these new opportunities and skill those people up, look at what others are doing. I was quite inspired by a trip to Greenwich um, last year when they launched their smart city strategy. And I went along with my colleague from procurement. And, they, and again, he had a kind of moment of really understanding what he needed to do. So I don't think there's a manual or a book written here, mm -hmm. but it is about finding those right people in the right departments and drawing them together and just getting on with this piece of work. I regret we're out of time for any further questions, but Theo, I'll just give you a 30-second window to, yeah. to summarise any final thought you wish to share. Uh, just picking up on that, um, we need to be, you know, we don't want to buy the wrong stuff, you know, just in, to go in, you know, sort of say, we'll respond <coughs> to the digital age by going out there and having this sort of mad procurement cr process <laughs> where we buy stuff that doesn't actually talk to other products or uh, ends up being redundant. Now, GDS uh, is an example where you know, on the projects, and I, and I think the challenge for local government is like, how do we figure, how, how, do, how do we work this one out? But GDS became powerful in Whitehall, which was buying all sorts of stuff that wasn't talking uh, to, uh, or wasn't doing the right thing. Uh, it became powerful because it had spending controls. Now, um, on a local public service level, we need to be talking about standards, we need to be bringing the right people in the room, not just within the council departments, but actually right across, across local public services in the region, sub-region, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of authorities have got together to promote this thing. I think it's a really important thing to do, but we need to kind of, you know, this, we've got really good staff in local government. We need to give people the power. Thank you very much. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Theo and Paul. Thank you very much.